All right, you guys can take your seats if you would. Hopefully you're getting an opportunity to meet some new folks. You get an opportunity to put some names and faces together. Hopefully you're building some relationships that might turn into the types of relationship you go grab a coffee or lunch after church or maybe you become really good friends, I don't know. But our hope is that you would discover belonging here in community. And so we just wanna give you the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, hey, so we are starting a brand new series today called How to Train an Elephant. I wanna start with, with, with just, I, I'm just kind of mesmerized and amazed a little bit by elephants. Maybe because I'm a large being and, and you know, game recognized game a little bit, I don't know. Um, but man, I, I, elephants are just kind of, kind of amazing. I, I love to share maybe a little bit of information, unless you just watch Nat Geo or you watch, you know, uh, Discover Kid, Discover Wildlife or whatever the heck that, that stuff is called. I'd love to share it. Can I share some, I mean, if we're going to be talking about elephants for a few weeks, I just feel like we all kind of need to be on the equal playing field of how amazing and impressive these animals are. Is that okay if we share a little bit? Yeah, because I may not share the things that you want to hear. My kid's favorite thing about elephants when we go to the zoo is to see how big the turd pile is. I won't be showing you any pictures of turd piles. All right, but I do want to throw a picture on the screen real quick and just kind of show you um, maybe a little bit about elephants. So elephants are, are kind of big, all right? So over here we have uh, I, the picture that I found doesn't just tell us humans, it just says homo sapiens. So if you needed to go back to, uh, you know, middle school science class, um, that's we are. We are homo sapiens. And then here, here is the African uh, male elephants. And then over here is the African female elephants. And, and I'd love to maybe share with you a little bit um, that elephants on average are 10 feet tall. That's as tall as like the rim on a basketball goal. Well, not the ones that I dunk on though. I lower those, but the regulation ones are 10 foot tall. They're 10 feet tall. Don't talk to them about weight because, you know, they don't like to talk about that so much because on average, they're about 16,000 pounds. Hello, somebody. <laughs> they, they ain't missing many meals. They're 24 feet long. Now, that's average. Now, that, that's, this, that's this blue elephant right here. This, this monster that's in pink in the background that's the largest elephant that has ever been seen or recorded. They found this elephant back in the 1950s. I'd love to tell you that the largest elephant ever recorded is 13 feet tall. And it looks down on its, you know, average people, kind of like I look down on most average height people. Um, it looks down on them and not only to him is, is all of the rest of his brothers and sisters just, you know, kind of dwarfy and puny. But my man is like pig out city. The largest elephant ever recorded weighed in at over 24,000 pounds. Oh my goodness. Jenny Craig needs to get a new business model to start helping the elephants maybe i don't know here's the one here's the amazing thing about elephants they're, they're so incredibly massive and large and, and you probably knew that they were big but did you know that on average the average element can reach elephant can reach a top speed of 25 miles an hour that's a whole lot of mass coming at you so Again, it's kind of one of those things. If me and you are ever in Africa together on a safari and we see an elephant, I don't have to be fast. I just have to be faster than you. <laughs> 25 miles an hour. Did you know that an elephant with its trunk can pick up over 750 pounds of whatever it is that it needs to pick up? I'm not talking about moving. I'm talking about like wrap itself around, pick it up, excuse me, please, and drop it. And at the same time, that same trunk can reach down and pick a single blade of grass. It's amazing. We oftentimes say, and we hear said, that lions are the king of the jungle. I was amazed this week to learn that when it comes to the, 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 the food pyramid and wildlife, that the adult elephant 
is the only mammal that they know of that has no natural predators. And I understand why. I ain't, I ain't gonna try to come after that thing. Matter of fact, it wasn't until humans came along and started realizing there's value in their tusks that elephants had really any predators at all, the full-grown elephants. And so these massively huge, ridiculously quick, overwhelmingly strong animals can still be trained to do this. Next picture. That dude is doing a headstand. I can't do that. And I clock in at just over, you know, 11,000 and some change pounds less than it. How is it possible that such massive and strong animals can be trained to do this? You see, here's the deal. I'm convinced that there are some essentials that every elephant trainer needs to know. And if we can understand some of those essentials, some of those basics that go into training these massive creatures, then we can begin to understand that some of these same tactics are the tactics that the enemy uses against us. This is the same tactics that the enemy uses against us to convince us to believe that I can't fill in the blank, I won't fill in the blank, I will never fill in the blank whatever your fill in the blank thing is. Or the enemy will use some of these similar tactics to convince us that that maybe it's not about what I can or cannot do. The enemy will try to convince us that God is unable to fill in the blank. That God will not or cannot fill in the blank. And so as we go through this series, we're gonna be spending some time uncovering and unearthing some of these these basic essential elements that every elephant trainer needs to know. And as we do, I'm believing that we're going to discover some things that are going to allow us to come to the point of recognizing that we are not helpless, that we, we can break through and we can break free whatever it is that has us bound and stuck in whatever area of life that we tend to be stuck in. And as we go through this series, we're going to be studying a man in the Bible by the name of David. And here's what we're going to find about David. David was a person just like you and me who went through a lot of incredibly difficult things in life. He went through being abandoned and disowned by his family. He went through in facing incredible obstacles. He went through making terrible decisions. He went through incredible tragedy. He went through remarkable and could have been debilitating disappointment. Yet David was a man who went, despite having gone through all of those things, we never seem to find that he gets stuck. Sure, you read through the Psalms and sometimes you're like, dude, get a Kleenex or something. And though there are times where he certainly wrestles with God and he pours his heart out to God, we never see in scripture a time where David allows a situation or a circumstance to cripple him and to catch him, to prevent him from continuing on about the business that God had set for him to do. And here's my belief. I believe that the enemy has been at work in our lives since the day that we were born to make us believe that we are stuck and to help us get to the point of believing that we are helpless in certain areas of our life. And I believe that God's intent for you, if you will walk with us on this journey for these six weeks, I believe that God's intent and desire for you is for you to hear loud and clear that in the name of Jesus, you are not helpless and you don't have to be stuck. And so we're going to dive into this series, and it's a little bit of a nod to C.S. Lewis and how he approached his, his famous work, The Screw Tape Letters. And so this series is kind of packaged a little bit as basic ext- instructions to an elephant trainer. And so we're going to learn some basic elephant training techniques. We're going to follow the hero of our, of our series, David. He's the main character that we're going to be studying and see how he was able to either get out of a situation or see how he was able to 
get through a situation without getting stuck. And then we're going to learn some key principles from God's word about that particular issue each week that hopefully, God willing, will help you and I break free from whatever it is that has got a hold on us and has kept us stuck in this area of our life. Because God's desire is that he work in you so that he can work through you. And he can't work through you if he's not working in you because you're still stuck. So we're going to go into, we're going to launch into the first lesson today. And the first lesson is the title of our message today is this. The first lesson for any young elephant trainer is that you've got to learn to chain them when they're young. You've got to learn to chain them when they're young. Here's what I mean by that. When baby elephants, uh, when, when they're still babies, elephant trainers will take chains and they will, they will wrap them around the leg of an elephant. And, and a baby elephant, at that point, it is its youngest and weakest phase that it will ever be in life. There will never be a time in that elephant's life where it is younger, smaller, or weaker. And so what an elephant trainer will do is an elephant trainer will take the chains, wrap it around its leg, and oftentimes tie the other end of a chain either to a tree or to a stake that's dug deep into the ground. And they'll chain that elephant's leg. And what, that, what the trainer is doing is helping that elephant to see and to understand that you aren't strong enough and you can't do this. You, you'll never break free. Psychologists call what elephant trainers are doing here, they are teaching them something that psychologists called learned helplessness. What is learned helplessness? Learned helplessness is the state of, of the mind where we learn to believe that we are incapable of breaking free or enacting any type of change. Learned helplessness says that, that creates a perception that there are no opportunities by escape and there's no means by which you will ever be able to affect change in an area of your life. This isn't just something that, that happens with elephants. It's something that happens with us. There are certain areas I'm willing to bet in your life where at some point in your life, you have thought, I, I, I will never break free from this. I'm never going to get over this. I don't know how I'll ever change. I don't know if this will ever be different. And what happens is when we get to the point where that has begun to take root in our minds, then what we end up getting to a point where we have a mentality of a woe is me. I'll never get ahead. I wish I could change, but I don't know how to. I wish things could be different, but I just feel like I'm stuck. I, who am I? <laughs> I can't change things. You see, David went through many things that very easily could have tripped him up and caught him in that trap but as we're going to see as we go through this series, as we're going to learn from David, we're going to learn the power of faith. We're going to learn the power of perspective. And we're going to learn about the resurrection power of Christ that is available to us. And when we begin to understand and activate those elements in our life, then we will begin to see God move and work in us and through us to break us free so that we are no longer stuck and bound by the thing that the enemy has been trying to chain us to. And so we're going to jump in and we're going to meet young David. We're going to be in our Bible study in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16. If you have them today, I hope you'll open them with me. We'll use them every time we get together. You guys with me? You starting to catch on a little bit? or Hopefully it brings a little clarity around what we're talking about here. And so I hope that you're, I'm excited to jump into it. Um, is anybody else? It, okay, good, good. I thought just amen all by myself for a second there. But 1 Samuel, chapter 16, we're going to pick it up in verse 1, and it says this. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Now I want to pause just for a second here. You got to understand who Samuel is. Samuel is a prophet of God. God all throughout the Old Testament would use these, these people called prophets and they would basically be kind of God's mouthpiece. So God would speak to a prophet and the prophet would then take God's message to God's people. Sometimes it was to a group of people. Sometimes it was to a king. Saul is the current king of Israel. 
Now, right before this, you can read about this, that Saul has, has made a big mistake. And because of the decision that he made in defiance and disobedience to God, God has announced to Saul through Samuel that Saul is not going to be the king of Israel forever. And that his children will not be the next king of Israel. That God is moving on from Saul to go find the next king of Israel. You thought you were having a bad day. Imagine being told, hey, good to see you. You're not going to be king anymore. That's who Samuel and Saul are. So God says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. That's just a fancy word of saying, that's like saying you're a Kansas Cityan. Jesse is from Bethlehem. For I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Samuel is not just a prophet, but he's pretty wise. Samuel's processing, okay, if Saul finds me, hey, Samuel, what you doing today? Oh, nothing, just on my way to go find your replacement. Saul's not stupid, or Samuel's not stupid. So the Lord says, take a heifer, that's a cow, okay, fellas, that's a cow. I made that mistake thought that was funny when I was in my high school years. I called a girl a heifer one time thinking it was funny. The things that are funny in Arkansas aren't funny in California, I learned. Actually, it was never really funny in Arkansas either. Yeah. Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one that I name to you. Verse four. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? Now that word trembled seems a little strange. Why would they have trembled? Well, it's important that we understand that Samuel isn't just a prophet, but because of his position, because of the role that he plays, Samuel is a pretty famous dude. Pretty much anyone in Israel is aware of who Samuel is. If not by facial recognition, they're certainly aware of who he is by his reputation of his name and his position. And not only that, there's not only a a, a realization of his fame, but there's a realization of the power that he possesses because he is recognized as a prophet of God. So naturally, the elders in Bethlehem see Samuel come and they're like, it's kind of like your kids when you walk into the bedroom and they like snap to attention real quick and they're like, I don't know if I did anything wrong, but I really hope I didn't because I really don't want to get in trouble. That's kind of what's happening here. All right. So when someone like Samuel rolls into town, people take notice. Verse five. And he said, peaceably, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So now here they are, they're at the sacrifice. Samuel is with Jesse and and with his sons. And it says in verse six, so when they came by, uh, he took Eliab, uh, and this this would have been Jesse's oldest son. This is a patriarchal society where the firstborn son gets double honor, double position. So the firstborn son, Eliab, uh, comes by and, and Samuel says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed is before him. So it was, uh, verse seven, but the Lord said to Samuel, hey man, don't, don't look at his, his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse sent Shema, and he passed by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Verse 11, and Samuel said to, Jason, said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And he out there keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Now I want to pause the story just for a second. And I want you to, the the son that's out in the sheep, this is David. This is the first time that we we meet the great hero of, of of the Israel people. He's a boy. He's the youngest 
of Jesse's sons, and he is out in the sheep, not invited to the party. Think about it from David's perspective. David's sitting out in the sheep, and, and, and listen, sometimes when God doesn't exactly tell us how things work, my imagination just starts running wild. So I just imagine J David is just out there with the sheep, doing things that young boys do as they're bored, watching sheep. Maybe he's, you know, throwing sticks, ball, rocks up and hitting them with a stick. I don't know. But he's out there, and he's just doing his thing. And all of a sudden, down the road, the dust cloud billows, and, and he sees, like, the, the train are coming. The, the people are coming. And at this point, word has already passed around town that Samuel's in town. So David knows kind of exactly what's going on. And there's only one house at the end of this road, and it's his. And so David knows that, man, Samuel's in town. And Samuel and his posse have now come to my house. Didn't nobody tell me about that. In fact, I, I, I have a tendency to believe that at some point, because Jesse very specifically says the, the youngest is out in the field tending the sheep. I think that that leads me to believe that at some point Jesse said, hey, David, we got some, we got some stuff going on tonight, um, but here's the deal. You're the youngest, and really nobody cares about the youngest, and don't nobody really care about you, and nobody really wants to talk to you because you're just young. So why don't you go on out there and take care of the sheep for us while me and your brothers come in and talk to Samuel? I'm sure that that wasn't the best moment of David's day. So David is there. He, he's tending the sheep, and all of a sudden he sees one of his brothers. Maybe it was Abinadab. Abinadab comes walking down and looking kind of glum, and David's out there like, hey, what you doing? And Abinadab's like, uh, what, well, what had happened was is um, they, Samuel wants to see you kind of mumbling it under his breath. And I just imagine David would be like, what? He wants to see who? He wants to see me? And in typical sibling rivalry fashion, I imagine Ben and I would be like, yes, idiot, don't make me say it again. Get your butt in there. I'll take care of the sheep. So David comes running. How do I know, how do I know that he was running? Because in a second, we're going to read that he was ready. That means his, his face and cheeks are red. I also have young boys, and, and I know that young boys don't really ever walk doing anything. Unless it's involving chores, and then they walk very slowly. But when it's something that they're interested or intrigued or excited about, they, they gone. They run in. And so I imagine David shows up, hair's all, you know, jacked up and, you know, face is all red and sweaty and he's certainly not wearing his Sunday best and he busts through the door, kind of nervous, kind of excited, curious, maybe a little anxious, not really sure what to expect and he shows up and it's like everyone is just standing around, not talking and waiting for him. I don't know if you've ever walked into a room that where no one was talking and everyone was just kind of waiting. That's an awkward situation. David, being a young boy, I imagine, probably did something to make it more awkward. David shows up. He enters the room, and it says this, verse 12. So he arose and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Wow. Talk about a, a dramatic change of events in a day. I think it's interesting that the Bible doesn't really give us any more detail here. Like according to the biblical account, like after all of that happened, Samuel leaves and then it's just like, just kind of leaves us on a cliffhanger where the scene is, and now David is in the room standing awkwardly with his brothers and his dad who just despised him and rejected him and did not even invite him to come to the party. And close scene. What happened? Well, I don't know for sure, but I think probably Jesse was, was thinking, well, I almost screwed that one up. I'm really glad that I didn't. I'm glad David got here um, because, man, if, David, if David's going to be the king, that, like, changes everything for our family. I mean, we're just a poor, fam poor shepherd family out in Bethlehem, which Bethlehem, like, nobody goes to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is, like, 
out in the middle of nowhere, right? Like, like people go out of their way to go to Jerusalem, but people don't go out of their way to go to Bethlehem, right? Like it's like, I don't know, like Smithville or Kearney. No offense if you live in Smithville or Kearney, but I don't know a lot of people that go out of their way to go to Smithville or Kearney when Kansas City is just a few more miles that way. So, so here we have, have this family in Bethlehem and Jesse's thinking, man, this, this changes everything. I mean, our, our family tree is now forever changed. We have a king in the family. Help! He's also probably pretty embarrassed. Imagine that conversation when Samuel's even, you know, really sorry about that. Um, I, brought, I brought the boys up that I thought really mattered. Or, I mean, well, hold on, let me retry. What I mean to say was is that, I, well, it's been really good seeing you. Hope you hope to come back some other time. Think about it from, from David's brother's perspective. I just imagine that when Samuel leaves, David's brothers turn and look at David. And David's like pent up, like, I don't really know what just happened. It's kind of like when you see a middle school boy the first time that their voice goes like that. And they're like, I don't really know what that was. I imagine David's kind of standing there a little bit like that. And then they look at Jesse. And then they look at each other and look back at David. And then they look at Jesse and look back at each other. And then I imagine just, boom, eruption. Going straight to their dad. Are you kidding me? We've done everything right. And that little twerp gets to be the next king? We have beat him three ways to Sunday. And how, what? You've got to be, you can't let this happen, dad. Dad, you cannot let this happen. We will, he will never hear the end of it. What do you think David is thinking in this moment? If you've ever been in a situation where your family despised you, rejected you, uninvited you, did something or said something that was hurtful. You see, that's exactly how David's feeling right now. I mean, on one hand, yes, he did just get to meet Samuel, and that was kind of awesome. And Samuel did just say that he's going to be the next king of Israel, which that's kind of amazing, but also I don't really know what that means from David's perspective. And he also made it really official when he opened up the oil and gave him an oil bath and anointed him as the next king of Israel. On the other hand, he's just been despised and rejected by his father and his brothers. He was left to go do the lowly work because nobody else wanted to do it. And here he is in this moment, the next king of Israel, still trying to process the wound that he just experienced from the people who were supposed to love him most, that loved him so little and thought of him as so insignificant that he didn't even get an invitation to come meet the prophet of the Lord. A moment that would have marked David's life had nothing happened when it comes to being a king. If all he did was meet Samuel, it would have been a moment that he would have talked about with his kids and grandkids. Hey, did I ever tell you the story about the time I met the prophet of the Lord? That there was so little love from his father that his own father did not even invite him into a storytelling, memory-making moment. You see, this is how the enemy works. The enemy wants to chain us when we're young. The enemy, when we are our youngest and when we are our weakest and when we are our smallest and when we are at our most vulnerable, the enemy wants to do something to, to chain us while we're young. Maybe for you, it's something that, that your dad said to you. Or maybe it was the verbal love and affirmation that your father didn't offer you. Maybe it was a thing that 
that your mom did that caused such wounds and so much damage? Or maybe it was something that your mom didn't do. Maybe, maybe you didn't have a great mom. Or maybe it wasn't a mom or dad. Maybe it was a brother or a sister or a family member or a friend who said or did something to you that you have carried with you ever since. You see, the enemy has been working ever since the moment that you have been born to find the thing to wrap around your wrist to chain you to where you are so that you can learn what it feels like to be helpless. Because as a child, you're young and you're innocent and you're impressionable and, 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 and you don't have a lot of power and you don't have a lot of strength and you really rely on those that you love most to provide for you, to protect you, to look after you, to take care of you, to, to shepherd you and to lead you and to help you grow and develop. Yet those very people sometimes are the ones that cause the thing that the enemy will use to wrap the chain around our lives. You see, that's how the enemy works. And even if the thing that has caused you to feel chained, even if that, the event, the thing that, that, that the moment where you begin to realize, man, I just feel stuck here. I don't know what to do. I don't feel like I'm ever gonna get over this. Well, yeah, I just, I, ha, I just, I, I am helpless. Be willing to bet that if you peeled back the layers of all of that, then you would begin to see that that the impetus, that the beginning of the thing that caused you to feel stuck, maybe just maybe be something that happened in your earliest years, when you were smallest and when you were weakest. You see, here's what every good elephant trainer knows. Every good elephant trainer knows that it is easiest to condition an elephant to learn to be helpless when it is its youngest and its weakest. That's why when they're so young, they'll tape and they'll they'll wrap the chain around their leg and they'll tie it to the tree so that they will overlearn the feeling of being helpless. So that they will overlearn that there's no hope for trying to escape. They will overlearn this conditioning to feel helpless so that they will give in and give up. Yeah, it's the same thing that happens with us. It's the same thing that happened with David. You see, the enemy knew exactly the type of potential that David had. The enemy knew that David had the potential of being a king, a warrior, a leader, someone who people would write about for thousands of years to come. And so the easiest way to overthrow a king is when he is still in kid form. So the enemy undoubtedly would have taken this event and would have taken this moment, the words and the actions of his family and would have tried to chain David to this moment so that he can never become the powerful king that God had destined him to be. You see, here's the thing that's true about me and you. The enemy also knows it's easiest to stomp out faith when it's still in seed form. And so the enemy has been at work in your life and my life from our earliest days to get us to a point in a moment where we feel chained and we feel helpless so that we don't have faith in our parents. We don't have faith in our family, that we don't have faith in in the ability to be able to, 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 to get somewhere that is better. And so that we ultimately lose faith in believing that I can fill in the blank or that God is able to fill in the blank. And so from the earliest days of your life and my life, the enemy has been following the the playbook of understanding that if you want to keep them stuck, you have to chain them when they're young. Yet in David, we see that he doesn't get stuck. 
as we're going to see as we go throughout the next several weeks, that we're going to learn that David went on to do some pretty amazing and phenomenal things. So what's the lesson to be learned here? You see, I believe that the lesson to be learned here is that David learned to listen to the right voice. You see, the voice of of Jesse and his brothers, they were telling him what they knew. They were telling him what they could see. they, they They were telling him what they understood to be true. But here's the problem. When we start allowing other people to speak things into our lives, that we then take those things and base our lives around it. Here's the problem. They didn't make you. They didn't wire you. They see with limited view and limited perspective who you are and what God has created you and wired you to do. When we go back to Ephesians 2.10, we learn, we talked about this several weeks ago, that God created us. We are his workmanship created beforehand for good works, which God did beforehand for us. Here's what it means. It means that God started looking around and said, hey, I need to do something. I'm going to create somebody to do that thing. So when you and I begin to allow people who did not make us to begin to define us, then we are submitting ourselves to the small and puny view and perspective that they have. But when we begin to understand and listen to the right voice, when we begin to listen to the word of God and the voice of God and understand what he says about us, then we begin to understand that the one who crafted me made me and they don't get to define me. I want you to notice how this works with David. Here's what they said with their actions and their words. Here's what they said. You're the youngest. You're the run of the family. Get out of our way, man. Nobody cares about you. But notice what God said in 16 verse 1. He told Samuel, I have provided myself a king among those sons. Here's what they said. They said, man, there's no need for you to even come. Nobody wants to see you. Man, go out and take care of that business. But here's what God said in 16 verse 7. Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. For the man does not see, for the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the heart. And you see, here's what they said. Why don't you go tend them sheep, boy? You see, to be a shepherd in that day and age would have been a, a non-respected craft. Shepherds were not viewed in high esteem. Matter of fact, they were viewed with no esteem. The work that they did was smelly and it was disgusting and it was kind of the lowest rung on the totem pole. Oftentimes in that culture, to to refer to someone as a shepherd would have been like a derogatory cuss word. Why don't you go tend them shepherd, boy? Why don't you let us handle this business? But here's what God said. Arise, anoint him for this. This is the one. You see, here's what David learned. That what they see and what they say about me is insignificant and doesn't matter in comparison to what God sees and what God says about me. Some of you have been listening to the wrong voices. You have been allowing voices of small-minded, small-vision people to define who God has created you to be and what God can do through you. And because of that, you have felt stuck. And for some of you, they is not some distant, unrelated person they or your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your siblings, the people who are supposed to love you the most. See, David experienced that. But David learned to listen to the only voice that mattered. You see, here's the deal. We've got to learn to ignore the voices from our past. You see, Jesse and his boys, 
They weren't God. They couldn't see what God saw. Where they saw a kid, God saw a king. That needs to sit in with somebody today. Because they, whoever they are, whoever they were in your life have said things to you. Things that you've just never been able to break free from. You see, it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they see. David didn't care about that now. Why? Because they were the voice of his past. All they could do was tell him who he used to be. All they could do was tell him where he came from. All they could do was to offer words of discouragement to hold him back and to prevent him and keep him from being who God has declared and defined him to be. So now it doesn't matter what they say. I don't care what they say anymore. Y'all talk all you want to talk because I ain't listening. David began to realize that the voice of God was the voice of his future. They wanted to bring David back, but God wanted to propel David forward. You see, in your life and my life, they want to take you back to what you did, what happened. They want to uh, never let you forget and never let you break free from that thing that happened to you, that thing that was said to you, that thing that you did. But they, they are the voice of your past. And it's time for some of us to start allowing they to get behind you. And you need to turn your face full force into the voice and the direction and the truth of what God has declared about you. You see, here's what you've got to understand. The whispers of the world cannot define what God has already declared. I'm going to say that again because you need to get that. You need to write that down. You need to package that with you and you need to take it with you this week. The whispers of the world, why are they whispers? Because they are in the past. Don't let them be a full voice. Don't let them be a scream. Don't let them yell at you. Let them be whispers in the past because the whispers of the world can't define what God has already declared. You say, yeah, but they said, the world's whispering into my, into my ear that I'm helpless. That's okay. Let me tell you what God has declared. God declared in Psalm 122 that I may be helpless, but I look at my, I cast my eyes onto the hills and I know where my help comes from. Call me helpless because I got Jesus. I'm good. The world is going to whisper to you that you're worthless. Huh? I have a hard time believing that. Because when I read in John chapter 3 and verse 16 that God so loved the world that he sent the most precious thing that he possessed to the earth, come running to rescue me and to ransom me and tell me that I am a, a son of God, a daughter of God, a child of the king, and a joint heir with Christ. You tell me I'm worthless? No, I'm good. I'm good because God's already declared something about my worth. The world might whisper to you, you can't, you won't, you'll never. Hmm. You're right. I can, but he can. And here's what God has declared over me in Philippians chapter four and verse things. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength to do it. So you go ahead and tell me I can, and I'm going to show you that God can. The world's going to whisper to you, hey, you're never going to get over this. This thing that they said, it, you have carried it with you as a label for so long and they are continuing to whisper into your ear, you ain't ever gonna get over this. You're never gonna leave the past behind. Don't you remember who you were? Don't you remember who you are? Don't you know who you, where you came from? Who do you think you are? I'll tell you exactly who I am. Romans chapter eight says that in Christ, I am more than a conqueror. You got nothing on me. whispers of the world cannot define in your life what God has already declared. Why is it so significant that an elephant trainer chain them when they're young? Because once an elephant overlearns what this feels like,
it begins to believe that this is all that will ever be. You see, an elephant doesn't have the foresight to be able to understand that I'm not always gonna be this small and I'm not always gonna be this weak. So what happens at some point, once it becomes obvious that the elephant has learned its lesson, an elephant trainer will take this off and put a flimsy old rope. And what happens is that every single time that elephant feels that tension, it goes back to believing that the chain is still on me. The trainer knows the incredible potential of the power and the size and the strength of an elephant. So they chain them when they're young and when they're bigger, they take the chain off and they attach a rope to them. And they don't oftentimes put the rope on a tree, they'll put it on a, on old flimsy wooden stake. And as soon as that elephant starts feeling that, that tug, it goes back to believing I'm chained, I'm chained, I'm chained. But that's not the reality. The problem is, is that even though the chains on its legs are gone, the chains on its mind are still there. And I've come to tell you that the chains on your leg are gone. In Christ, you have been set free. You are a new creation. What they said doesn't define who you are. So you've got to get a new mindset. You've got to be transformed, as Romans says, by the renewing of your mind and understand that the chain is not on me anymore. Jesus set me free from it. And not only is the chain not on me, all the, all the enemies got on me is some old flimsy stuff because Jesus done took all this stuff and nailed it to the cross and said, hey, I am free. What's the difference between an elephant and David? You see, ultimately, that's the lesson that you and I need to learn. That elephant didn't know its potential. And had David only listened to the voice of his past, he wouldn't have either. But David listened to the right voice. And the voice of God said, I know they only see a kid, but let me tell you what I see. I see a king. And it says at the end of that section that the spirit of the Lord was with David from that day forward. The enemy knew the potential, not of David, but of the power of the spirit of the Lord at work in somebody's life. And I'm here to tell you that today, if you belong to Jesus, that same spirit of the Lord dwells in you. And the enemy wants to continue to believe that you've got no other option than to hold on to this chain because this chain is holding on to you. But God has said, I've set you free from this. You don't have to live like this. I've set you free. And if you'll walk with me, if you'll believe me, if you'll trust in me. You're going to see me do amazing and powerful and incredible things. And here's the deal. God knows that that potential is there. The enemy knows that potential is there. And by the power of faith and the power of perspective of choosing to listen to the right voice, then you too can understand the incredible potential and the power that is in you that God created you for and put his spirit in you to possess. And it's time for me and you to get to the point of understanding I'm not a slave, I am free. And for some of us today, I want you to understand this, that if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I wish I had good news for you. Without Jesus, this is the only truth you'll ever know. But it's not the only truth that is. And so if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we would love nothing more than to tell you about our King who came to set us free. The King whose voice we're trying to listen to so that we aren't chained to our past, but that we can be set free to live the incredible potential that God has created us to live in. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Jesus, I come and I pray for every single person in this place. 
I pray, God, that you would help every single person get to the point of identifying the voices of their past. And I pray, God, that they would understand that every single time they listen to the the voices of their past, they aren't encouraging or edifying voices. They are evil. They are vindictive. They are small-minded. They are belittling. They are demoralizing voices that you came to set us free from. So for the person in the room that has a relationship with you, Jesus, I pray that today would be the day that they would tell the voices of their past to get where they belong, which is back into their past. And that they would choose to listen to the voice of God and the truth of, you, of what you have said in your word about who they are and what you want to do in them and through them. And for the person that's here today that doesn't have a relationship with you, God, I pray. Oh, Lord, I pray. I pray that they could begin to walk in the sweet freedom of what it feels like to no longer be bound. To be shackled by their sin and their shame and their failure, but to be set free and to be made a new creation, to be made alive in Christ and to walk in the abundant life that you declared that you want us to have. God, we're gonna stand and we're gonna worship a powerful God and we're gonna declare an incredible truth. And if there's anyone in this place who needs to get a, get a connection with you, that needs to make a decision for you, that needs to say, hey, today I'm gonna to trust in Jesus as my savior, I pray that they would be willing to step out and allow us to come alongside of them and help them shoulder that burden. If there's someone that's here today that, that wants to finally get past the voices of their past and begin listening to the voice of their future and their potential and what you created them and designed them to be about, then I pray today, God, that they wouldn't stay seated in their seat or stay planted where they are, but that they would take a step of faith and believing that they would put their actions, their actions would speak louder than their words and that their faith would be grown to begin to realize that you have a new truth, a new reality and a new life for them to walk in that is free from the voices of the past. So God, as we stand, as we worship you today, would you stand with us? Would you sing with us? Would you declare this truth for your life? And would you allow us to minister to you? If we can pray for you, come see us in next steps. And would you declare this over your life today? Would you sing it?